Well, good morning. I know you're supposed to say it's good to be here, but it really is. Thank you for your southern hospitality. And, you know, for those of us that don't live in Texas, please, Texas, stand strong. We, we in the rest of the country need you to stand strong down here. You know what I'm talking about. I told you I was going to make a comment about your Astros. So the truth is we're just having fun. The several years that I spoke at Sandy Creek, I would uh, get all my Cardinal shirts and wear one every day at Sandy Creek. And so one year, I don't know if it was lunch or dinner, uh, Chad and Mike, uh, in front of all the boys, presented me with an Astros jersey, <laughs> which, by the way, I still have and still wear. People in St. Louis are like, who is this? But I don't wear it because I'm an Astros fan. I wear it because it brings back fond memories of the special times we've had at boys camp. Very special. Please pray for your camps. Support your camps. Get involved in your camps. Brother Fish doesn't know this, but I was so thrilled last night to hear him talking about Abraham and faith and the reason why is I, I teach a lot of seminars on the clarity of the gospel. And lately, over, well, not lately, but over the years, there's been confusion on what faith is and what saving faith is. People are trying to stuff in the term faith concepts from other words. And he used one of the verses that I use uh, in Romans chapter 4, if you'll indulge me. Romans chapter 4, verse 20, he, speaking of Abraham, did not waver in unbelief at God's promise, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Here it is, verse 21. Now, if you want a good definition of what faith is, a good concept, here it is. And ironically, Sarah says the same thing in another passage. Because he was fully convinced that what God had promised he was also able to do. Isn't that great? What is faith? Believing what God tells you. So what is saving faith? Believing that what Jesus tells us about eternal life is true. And what does he tell us? He who believes in him has everlasting, everlasting life. So, brother, thank you this morning. We are going to return to our study from last night, part two, the staggering, extravagant love of God. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. We're going to do a few stopovers before we get there, though. Zephaniah, theologians tell us, is one of the most well-known books about being the least known book in the Bible. So we're going to look at that. So in our study, we started last night, we have been talking about how the fall of humanity into sin has adversely affected our view of how we consider our Heavenly Father. We somehow override the overwhelming body of evidence in the Scripture regarding how very much God loves us. Sin has distorted that within us. We question God's love. Well, I know he loves everybody else, but what about, you know, how could he love me because of what I did or so forth and so on? Why do we do this? Why do we allow these joy stealers, these imposters, these thoughts to rob us of that intimate relationship that God designed us to enjoy? We not only miss out on it, but God also misses out on it. The one who brought the cosmos into existence has spoken. And what he says go. He didn't stutter. What he has said about his extravagant, staggering love for us, that's what goes. I want you to listen this morning to 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, and let's I know we've heard this verse, but let's try to look at it through some fresh eyes this morning. The Apostle John said this, See what great 
love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And I love how the verse ends. And we are. Did you ever think of the exact wording of that verse? Let's just slow down and think this through. The king of the cosmos, the triune divine being, resolved not to exist without us. He brought us into existence and showered us with his love. Sometimes we look at this concept through the filter of our fallenness and it loses its punch. Notice the word great. I mean, John could have said, notice what love the Father. He doesn't. He gets out these these words. Notice the great love of God. Do you know that you are greatly loved by God? Yes, he knows about everything going on in your life. But beloved, you are greatly, you're not just loved. What does the verse say? You're greatly loved. It's the Father's great love. And the mind-boggling love among the Trinity, think about this. God existed out of eternity. We know that, right? We got good theology here at Manville Bible Chapel. Imagine the love between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And think about this. They, they, they didn't need anything. Can you imagine God's, oh, you know, to be really actualized, we need to bring the human race into existence so we can feel better about ourselves. We know they love us. God needed nothing. He doesn't need food. He was around before there was a harvest. He doesn't need light. He was around before the sun. He doesn't need us to fulfill any need in him. And yet they willed, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit willed that they would bring us into existence. Do you ever think of why? So that love between them could cascade out onto us. The Father willed that heaven wouldn't be without us. I don't know about you, but that's pretty staggering. And then the Son comes from heaven to lay down his life for us so the king of the cosmos can bring us into his family, like this verse says. See what great love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. God's my father. We can call him Abba. I'm sure you have heard and seen about the James Webb Space Telescope, right? Now, the Hubble one blew me away. I didn't need another one. But have you seen these images lately of the cosmos, the galaxies, and the trillions of stars? That's your Abba. When you bow your head and you say, Heavenly Father, you are talking to the creator of the cosmos. Why would he love us? You know, last night I told you that grace is my favorite theme in the Bible. Cindy and I and my family, we're we're just blue-collar, normal people from St. Louis. The greatest thing about us is our connection to Calvary. And I told you that unofficially, the, the, the wonderful grace of Jesus is kind of our national anthem, our family anthem. But I have a, a personal verse, and it comes from King David, not that I'm a king or anything. But when I think of the a marvelous grace of God and how he loves me, you know what my, my life verse is? Same words of David. Who am I? Who am I? And what is my family that you have brought us this far? I marvel that the king of the cosmos would care to bring us into existence and pour out his lavish love upon us. Now you may be thinking, ah, yeah, that's good for you, Kev. You don't know my past. You don't know what I did. You don't know how messy my backstage is. Well, God does. God does, and he still loves us. 
Let me ask you a question. Those of us who've had adult children and all, teenagers and girls, sometimes our children don't, don't follow the Lord. When they're on, off in the far country, do we love them any less? Would we do anything to get them back? If dirty, rotten sinners like us would do that, imagine the king of the cosmos, the love that he has for Humpty Dumpty's broken sinners like us. Jeremiah 31.3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I, I have trouble getting my head around that. Human love has a starting point. I met my dear wife in 1979, and I tell you, I fell in love. I don't know if you believe in love at first sight. I don't know if it was love or infatuation or whatever. But my love for Cindy began at a point in time. And I want you to get this concept. God's love for you didn't have a starting point. Doesn't have an end point. God's love for us is like that. I mentioned last night a book uh, by this missionary in Bolivia, Jurgen Schultz. I wrote him an email. I said, man, I really love your first book, What God Wished, or What, Je Let's see. what Jesus Wished Everybody Knew About God. He wrote me back. He said, oh, if you like that, you'll like my second book. And boy, I'll tell you, it was so good. It's so good that Cindy and I just use it on, as a like daily devotion. Just read a page or two, and you're just like, oh, i got to stop and take this in. But in his book, he quotes... Michael Barrett, he says, Our sonship rests on a love that never began as well as a love that will never end. Sometimes it's hard for us sinners to accept that. Have you ever thought about that? Let that trickle down into your nervous system. When God says, I love you with an everlasting love, let me ask you a question. Do you understand just who it is that is saying that to you? Maybe you should Google when you get home tonight some of the images on the James Webb telescope and look at the vastness of the universe. That's your dad. That's your father. The one who created that is saying to you, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Do we understand the one who is opening his heart to us? The one who stands behind those words. It is the one who hangs the galaxies like we hang a shower curtain. It's the one who speaks and the winds and the waves obey him. Oh, that's one of my favorite passages. You know, the apostles are out on the boat and there's a storm and Jesus gets up and all of a sudden it's calm. Did you ever think of the, the response of the apostles? They're like backing away from him going, who is this one that even the wind and the waves Obey him. That's the one who says, out of his word, I love you. I love you. Max Lucado, in his book 316, says this. When he darts his eyes, oceans swell. When he clears his throat, <clears throat> birds migrate. When he banishes bacteria, he does it in a single thought. And yet we hear his words about his love and we still doubt him. That's because we see it through the filter of our fallenness. We accuse him of not being good. We reject his love. And so, beloved, as we continue in our study today and tomorrow, I'd like to lay before you a challenge, perhaps a prayer. Here's a challenge for you. Going forward, my challenge is let's make it a lifelong goal to abandon the benign and lukewarm thoughts about God and his great love and kindness toward us. I was standing outside before the meeting and basking in the warmth of your lovely state because when we came here it was 27 degrees in St. Louis. Bask, make it a lifelong goal to just take in the warmth of the love of God. It'll drastically change your life. Love is not something that God does. It's who he is at his core. Listen to this verse. 
1 John 4, 16. And we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. It's like we need a drum roll and cymbals going off here for the next phrase. God is love. He doesn't necessarily do love. He is love. That's why the Trinity wanted this love to gush out from them to bring us into existence. Have you ever thought, why are we here rather than not here? And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. Wow. Our understanding and acceptance of God's love for us directly affects our personal development and our intimacy with him. Our growth, our intimacy with Christ is stunted and wrong and jaded with bad thoughts about God. Listen to A.W. Tozer. Nothing twists and deforms the soul more than a low or unworthy conception of God. I hope you're not still protesting. Oh, Kevin, you don't know about my past, my skeletons. You don't know my deepest thoughts. If you did, then you'll understand why I struggle with bad thoughts about God. I got news for you. God knows about your skeleton. He knows everything we've done. He knows everything we will do. And the surprising thing is he still loves us. As humans, we tend to pull away from the down and outers, those that are walking away from God. We don't have the attitude like the father, the prodigal son. Do you know that God knows? I know you know this. He knows our thoughts. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly all about us, and he still loves us. For example, just a little sampling from Matthew. It's warming and comforting, but it's also scary that Jesus knows our thoughts, right? In Matthew 12, 25, Jesus knowing their thoughts. You know, talking about the Pharisees. He knew what they were thinking. Matthew 22, 18, perceiving their malicious intent, Jesus said. Did you ever come across those passages when you're, oh, wow, Jesus knows our thoughts. But in a positive side, he knows everything about us and he still loves us. You see, in God's kingdom, one val one's value is not determined by our past. It is not determined by our, our morality, our failures. What is valued, get this, is sonship. Sonship. Those of us who've had children walk away, that child in the foreign country is so dear to our heart. Isn't he or she? They may cause grief, but we still love that child. We still pray for that child. And so let's look at our passage. Zephaniah chapter 3. We're only going to look at one verse in Zephaniah. And as our dear professor would tell us, we interpret the Bible grammatically and historically. So historically, Zephaniah didn't sit down and go, all right, I'm going to write this to the people at Manville. No, it was written to Israel and the surrounding nations about the coming judgment. But there are eternal truths to extract, application to be made, and that's what we will be doing in the next moments. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17 The Lord your God is among you, a warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will be quiet in his love. He will delight in you with singing. Interesting verse, wouldn't you say? I remember the first time I read this, I oh, can't be talking about me, but he is. These apply to us. Let's just take the verse apart here little by little. Of course, our translations are different, but mine and the uh, Christian Standard Version says, a warrior who saves. Notice that God's attitude toward delivering us from our mess is not tepid. Not passive, not lukewarm. Notice how Zephaniah describes God. He's a warrior who saves. 
This is not the effeminate, skinny European Jesus that we see in paintings. Zephaniah is describing a strong warrior. This is the God who looks out for us. This is the God who comes to our aid. This God is described as a strong, passionate soldier who has counted the cost of a negative outcome of battle, and yet he plunges forward. What's his motivation? You guessed it, his love for us. But notice the verse says he rejoices. He uses the word gladness, quiet in his love. Notice how the prophet describes how we become the objects of his affection. Think about this, beloved. What people has a God who rejoices over them with gladness? It's almost hard for us to accept. Oh, not me. No, oh, no, not me. I'm a sinner. How can we do It's here in black and white. Can you imagine Baal or some of the other false gods even saying something like this? He rejoices over you with gladness. In man-made religions, the supernatural and the natural, they do not mix. In false religion, man is always roped off, held at a distance. Their gods are distant, they're far off, they're aloof. Not our God. Our God shows up. Did you ever think about this? Listen to this. Adam and Eve drop the ball. They blow it royally, right? What does God do? "Eh, Let's go to plan B. We'll start with somebody else. No. What does he do? He shows up. Adam. He keeps showing up. He shows up at Mount Sinai. He shows up in the tabernacle. Later on, he shows up in the temple. And then he really big time showed up where? In the manger. He keeps coming back. Did you get the idea? Now, here's the difference. In all those appearances that I just mentioned, he left. He always went back. But there's coming a day. There's coming a day. I don't know if you remember this, but you know, we, we sing these songs about our eternal home being up in heaven. I got news for you. That's a, that's a temporary stopover on the way to the main event. For example, Cindy and I, Lord willing, are going to fly home. We have a temporary stopover in Tulsa. We're not excited, oh, Tulsa, oh, I can't wait to get there. Our goal is St. Louis. The third heaven, if I drop over dead, boy, you are a hard crowd. At this point, you're supposed to say, aww. So let's try this again. If I fall over dead, thank you. My self-esteem is back intact. I'm going to go to the third heaven. To be absent from the body is the presence of the Lord. But if you read the last two chapters of the Bible... We're coming back. And did you ever read that? It's mind-blowing. It says, God will make his dwelling with man. Now, if I was writing the Bible, I'd have that reverse. We're going to make our dwelling with God. But that's not what the Bible says. He's coming back. And here's the difference. This time, he's staying with humans. Blows my mind. In Christianity, the eternal and the temporal intersect. Here's God's depict, uh, God is depicted in two ways. Rejoices over us with gladness. And notice what it says, quiet or soothing over us with love. The Good News translation says he will sing and be joyful over you. The imagery shifts from a strong warrior to a gentle mother. I love how the Bible writers do this. They're so uh, descriptive. Like a gentle mother, quiet in her love, singing over. Imagine a little mo- you know, young mother, got her baby. I don't know about you, but have you ever noticed the young mothers in your assembly, your churches? They don't rough up their babies. They don't drop them. And you know, Once in a while we do. But most of the time we're, we're sh- uh, protecting them, we're shielding them. This is the idea here. It's like a young mother wooing and and comforting a crying baby. Some translations refer to this as soothing 
love. And what's interesting here is that most of the time in the Bible, love is expressed in Hebrew as that hesed love, God's unfailing love. But there's a different word here. There's a different word. He will be quiet in his love. It's a different word, and it refers to the passionate love of, that Jacob had for Rachel or that Jonathan had for David. Soothing love. It's another aspect of God's love. He will be quiet in his love. It's a love that rejoices over us with gladness, a soothing, quiet love like a nursing mother. Now, this is the part that I found most interesting. He will delight in you with singing. Now, I'll have to be honest with you. Rarely in Scripture do we see God singing. Perhaps Jesus sang a hymn when he left the upper room. It doesn't say he was singing. Probably was. I don't know. Hebrews 2.12 refers to Jesus singing. But to my knowledge, and please help me if I'm wrong. Please show me. I'd be open to... In my studies, this is the only time that I find the Father singing. And what does he sing? Zephaniah here describes here a passion that bursts forth and sings over the one who is deeply loved. I know in our brokenness it's hard for us to even imagine. What? The king of the cosmos sings over me? Banish the thought. Well, that's what it says in black and white. His gladness and delight over us. His children, he sings. But wait a minute. Doesn't God know we're, we're wretched, miserable, blind, naked, as the letter of the church in Ephesus describes us? Yeah. Why would the Lord be persistent in pursuing us? Listen to what George MacDonald says. This is and has been the Father's work from the beginning to bring us into the home of his heart. Listen, that is your destiny. Your destiny, my destiny, to be brought in to the heart of God. And if you're struggling with God's love for you, beloved, this morning, don't look at him through the lens of our failures and our guilt Look at him through the lens of what the Bible actually says about his thoughts about us. Let the word of God be your guide. So Zephaniah doesn't stutter here. God is a strong, passionate, and warrior-like person concerned with our well-being. He rejoices over us with gladness like a loving, nursing mother soothes their child. And he delights over us with singing. We're going to shift gears now to another passage, but I'd like to give you some advice before I do. If you want to enjoy the staggering, extravagant love of God, don't look to yourself to see if you are worthy. Don't do that. Look to what God actually says about you in the Bible. Folks, the last, the last place you want to look to see if you're worthy is yourself. Come on, we're like yo-yos. We're good one day, we're down the next. We want to conquer the world for Christ one day, we don't want to talk to anybody the next. The safest thing you can do is look to the Word of God to see what He says about you. Shifting gears now to our final passage. Would you please turn to Matthew chapter 11? We're going to look at a familiar passage here. And let's look at it with some fresh eyes this morning. Matthew chapter 11. You know that famous passage, come unto me. Well, that's the one. I hope we could be refreshed by this passage. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Let's read it through the lens of what we've been talking about this morning. Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 28. The words of our Lord Jesus. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, 
and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. In his book, Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers, author Dane Ortland shares something that his dad pointed out to him that he learned from Charles Spurgeon and that I would like to pass on to you. By the way, if you struggle with accepting the love of God in your life, I highly recommend this book by Dane Ortland, Gentle and Lowly. Here's what the author says. In the four gospel accounts given to us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 89 chapters of biblical text, there's only one place, this is amazing, there's only one place where Jesus actually tells us about his own heart. Now, don't get me wrong. The four Gospels gives us some amazing information about how great Jesus is. Nothing came into existence without him. He's the great I am and so forth and so on. But it's only one part where Jesus kind of pulls back the curtain so we could see how he really is. And he tells us, and it's in this passage. Others speak of his greatness. You know what he said? I am gentle, I am lowly. This is why Jesus was a people magnet. The misfits, the dregs of society didn't need a religious figure to make them feel worse about themselves. That's why they didn't go to the Pharisees. I'll share my story, or not my story, but how I see things. You know, when I shoot myself in the foot and I need help from somebody, I'm not going to somebody that's going to point their finger, how could you? You should have known better. You were stupid. I don't need a lecture. As a matter of fact, I've been serving the Lord for over 40 years. Many, most of them as an elder, and we have had uh, the opportunity to have many come who had fallen away from the Lord for various sins. And I've observed there's two kinds of people that, there's two kinds of repentance. There's the King Saul kind that wants to get everything, all right, let's sweep it under the carpet, let's get my image going here. Remember when Samuel, um, not Samuel, when Saul blew it, Samuel says, I'm done with you. And Saul said, no, no, come with me so then the nation may see. See, it was all about image management. And then there's David. When David shot himself in the foot and the prophet came, do you remember David's response? I'm the man. And when I see folks come to be restored, I observe what kind of repentance we're talking about. And the King David kind, you know the last thing they need? They don't need a lecture from me. They're feeling bad enough. Matter of fact, many of the men who have fallen into sin say this phrase, Kevin, I don't know what I was thinking. And now they've come to their senses, and the last thing they need is a whack upside the head from me. Makes me think of Galatians 6 1. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of, yeah, considering yourself lest you also fall. This is why people flock to Jesus. You know, in my studies of the four Gospels, you know what I've found? Jesus only had an issue with one kind of group, and that was those self-righteous Pharisees. All the other people, the woman caught in adultery, no lecture, no raking over the coals, neither do I go and sin no more. Peter I imagine Peter thought he was really going to be raked over the coals. You know, the last person he wanted to see after the rooster crowed was Jesus, right? Jesus doesn't rake him over the coal. You know, but in street language, you know what Jesus says? Peter, use your failure now to shepherd my people 
who fail. You would think we'd get the lecture. And yet what we get is gentleness and lowliness. It gives them hope. He sympathizes. Don't you want... I will tell you, that the people who have most affected my life are not the big names, the big theologians. They're people who love me. That stick with me through thick and thin. That's who Jesus is. He, I know we hear this over and over, but think about it. He sympathizes with your weaknesses. He knows where your weak points are. And our tendency is to pull away. We're so ashamed. Can I give you some counsel when you're struggling? Lean in. Let Jesus meet you in your trials, in your temptations. Rather than projecting on God an image through the filter of our fallenness. It's, I know it's counterintuitive. But we need to let Jesus into our temptations, our trials, and our struggles. And this is what our passage is inviting us to do. Jesus has an open door policy. Come to me. He's gentle. He lo- he's lowly. He sympathizes with our messy lives. He welcomes us. He's open for business for sinners who need help. But I want you to notice something. What kind of help he offers. It's soul help. Did you catch that? You will find rest for your what? This is the kind of rest you can't sleep off. Soul rest. It's the kind of rest we need when our children go off the rails. Or when we get the the bad news of some other thing going on in our lives. Now, let's see. I'm going to have a test here to see if you're qualified for this kind of help. There's two qualifications in this passage. You may not be qualified. And you know what they are? Let's look at the passage. Come to me, all you who are, here they are, number one, weary. Here's number two, burden. Do you qualify? Do you qualify for this kind of rest? I think we all do, don't we? It's this kind of rest you just don't sleep off. What's interesting here is that Jesus doesn't require some grand gesture to get back in his graces. There's no price to be paid, by the way. You're not going to be billed by this therapist. It's free. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. No grand gesture required. Just go to Jesus in your brokenness. I told you last night I was in sales. Here's some advice from a salesman. This is a good deal. This is a good deal. We come and exchange our weariness, our burdens, and Jesus gives us rest for our souls. He exchanges our ashes for jewels. He restores the years that the locust have eaten. Can I ask you a hypothetical question? This morning, are you weary and heavy laden? I have news for you. Help is available. And the most understanding person in the universe, the sympathizing king of the cosmos, waits to unburden your weariness and provide you with soul rest free of charge. Free of charge. Let's spend just our final moments looking into the heart of Jesus. You know, when I read the Gospels, it's like, Lord, how'd you do it? You know, as an elder, there's sometimes we go, Lord, give me a few days off here. I can't handle it anymore. You read Jesus. He's up early praying. He's late at night healing. I've always wondered about the emotional life of the Lord Jesus. Do Do you ever think he gets fed up with people? I mean, think about it. Nobody comes to Jesus and says, hey, I'm having a wonderful day. Good to see you. Anybody coming to Jesus has a problem. 
But he never gets fed up. He never throws in the towel. The Gospels gives us a peek into the emotional life of Jesus and his attitude toward needy sinners. Far from being fed up, we find Jesus' heart drawn toward sinners. Drawn toward the misfits, the outsiders, the lepers, the adulterers, the prodigals. Theologian B.B. Warfield many years ago did a study on the Gospels, and when he was finished, he concluded that the emotional word that most describes Jesus is the word compassion. Compassion. Aren't you glad that our Savior is compassionate? I don't know about you, but I need compassion all the time. Again, let's uh, do a survey from Matthew. Matthew 9, 36, when, the, when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. I will confess to you, when I see a crowd, I'm sorry, I don't feel compassion. Oh, no, traffic jam, how are we ever going to get there? Not Jesus. He sees a pile up on the highway and he has compassion. Matthew 14, 14, when he went ashore, he saw a large crowd, had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Matthew 20, 34, moved with compassion. Jesus touched their eyes. Immediately they could see, and they followed him. And this is just Matthew. Jesus responds to human suffering. Turn with me to... One of my favorite passages in John 11, 33 through 36. I'll set the tone. We're, we just have a few minutes left. Jesus is outside of Lazarus' tomb, Mary, Martha. It's interesting, you know, we don't really think of Jesus as having special friends, close friends. But I think these three were Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He hung out there, a place where he could kick up. And you know the story. Lazarus dies. Jesus, if you would have come, my brother would not have died. They bring him to the tomb. Matthew, uh, John chapter 11, look at verse 33. So, us elder types, we have an opportunity to do a lot of funerals. This is my favorite funeral. When Jesus saw her crying, and the Jews who had come with her crying, did you ever notice this? He was not just moved, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Now think about this. Jesus shows up at your funeral. What would you think if you found out that he was deeply troubled in his spirit? Wow, that's what Jesus thinks of me? Lord, they told him, come and see. And then we have that famous two-word verse, Jesus wept. But there's one thing more I want to point out here. There's a crowd with Mary and Martha. They're observing this. And I like what the crowd says. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. If Jesus showed up at your funeral... And the people went home, and at home they're saying, wow, Jesus really loved Thombi or Chad or Kevin. How'd you make, how would that make you feel? Remember how Jesus said over the distress of Jerusalem? When he approached, he saw the city, and he, what did he do? Ah, they deserve to go to hell. No, he wept over the city. This is our Jesus. It's my prayer as we close now that these passages serve to help us begin to see the extravagant, staggering love of God. Beloved, there is a wideness to the love and mercy and grace of God. Perhaps today you feel you've been banished, as we said last night, to the cheap seats of Christianity because something that has happened in your life, maybe an affair, an abortion, some secret sin now, or something you're struggling with. 
I have news for you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have a rescue plan to bring you back into harmony. You can come home. There is a wideness to the mercy and grace and love of God. A study of the Gospels will show that Jesus doesn't rough up those seeking him. He does not kick us to the curb when we fail him. His love and tenderness surpasses our brokenness. He embraces us in the midst of the debris field of our failures. One theologian put it this way, the church is full of prodigals discovering to their astonishment that their father still loves them. Let me close now with a story. In his book, Unoffendable, another great book, by the way, Brant Hansen includes a story about a small group of American soldiers during World War II who sought out a burial site for one of their fallen friends. They were pulling out the next day and were hoping to bury him in a fenced churchyard, church cemetery nearby, and the sun was setting. They approached the house next to the church and knocked on the door, and the priest answered, and they asked the priest, hey, could we, could we bar, uh, bury our friend in your cemetery? I'm sorry, he replied, but that's only for members of our church. The priest went on to tell the soldiers they could, if they chose, bury their comrade near the cemetery, but outside the fence. Yeah, they were kind of saddened, but had few options, so they did that. They buried their friend right on the other side of the fence. The next day, they wanted to visit their fellow fallen soldiers' gravesite one last time before moving on, and they came to the churchyard, and they were shocked they couldn't find his grave. It simply wasn't there. One of them went to the parsonage door and knocked, and the priest comes, hey, what happened? The grave we dug, it's not there. We did it last night. The priest said, oh, it's still there. The soldier was baffled. The priest said, well, you see, last night I couldn't sleep. All I could think about was what I told you, that you couldn't bury your friend inside the fence. The priest said, I regretted that, so last night I got up and I moved the fence. I want to be like that. I want to move the fence to include those that don't belong. This is who Jesus is. He's a fence mover. He moves the fence. I like this story. It reminds me of how we like to build walls and fences to separate the insiders from the outsiders. Jesus was a person that liked to include people. As we uh, finish now, I'd like to pray that we'd have a clear vision of the staggering, extravagant love of God. I pray that we will not look at God through the lens of our sin, our guilt, our shame, and my prayer today is that we would see him not as a tepid savior, but a mighty warrior. Not as one, one who rejoices over us with soothing like a nursing mother. And this is amazing. One who delights over us with singing. One who is gentle and lowly, who offers soul rest. Let's pray. Lord, help us to make it our life goal to banish tepid thoughts of your great love for us, I pray in Jesus' name.